Amen, amen. Welcome to church, praise God. For all the Better Life campuses, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Luke Keller. I, uh, I'm gonna give myself a quick pub just so Pastor Daniel has to uh, invite me back. But I, um, I, I spent four years here playing football. I had the best four years, not of my life, but of, of a young life here in Moorhead. I was an All-American, um, had, had an opportunity to get drafted, um, ended up having a left ankle surgery. The doctor operated on the wrong ankle, so I had left ankle surgery, operated my right ankle instead, took seven ankle surgeries to fix. Um, yeah, yeah. That was the same response I had when like, the doctor walked in and said, hey, we've operated on the wrong ankle, right? Like, it's like, what do you, what? My mind was blown. Um, but when that happened, I, I walked out of, um, actually I had to go to, to, to Nashville, Tennessee, to the Tennessee Titans head doctor, um, one of the head doctors of, of Center, Center of Disease and Control, because I had a, a surgical infection, it was life-threatening, I spent three weeks in the hospital, and when I walked out of there, um, one of the first reporters, there were reporter, reporters all around, and one of the first reporters stuck a microphone in my face, and I remember like it was yesterday, she said, Luke, what are you going to do now? And my response to her was, God has chosen me to do something that he hasn't chosen anyone else to do. And that's the same, the same is true for you. Do you believe that about your life? That you were born here, that you're here in this room, that you're here watching for a purpose? That none of this is just by mistake or by accident? And she, when, when, I, when I said that to her, her, she was almost like, it was like this look of disdain. One, probably because I mentioned God, but two, my, my dreams, my career was over. And she knew that. And so when she asked what, how I could say that I shared my backstory and how I came to know Christ at the age of 17, and I came to know Christ only through this, this near-death experience where I almost took my own life. And so I'm not gonna share that with you today, but I'm setting the stage for next time PD asked me to come back. <sighs> um, I do, I would, I would have to mention this. My wife and I got married my sophomore year of college and our first church we attended as a, as a couple, as a married couple, was this church. First time we started tithing, we had nothing. I mean, we were broke college kids, married together and we got married for one reason. You just let that set in, I know. <laughs> We had nothing. And PD gave, gave a sermon on tithe one time, and I, it was, I, I was new to faith, right? I mean, I'm 21, 22 at the time. I got saved at 17. I didn't grow up in church. And so I heard this. It was like, man, God says to do it. Like, I, I want to be obedient. I've given my life to Christ, so here we go. And, and the, the principles that my wife and I learned at this church and what's been sowed into our lives and, and, and our faith I wanna let you guys know, and I think one of my first pictures here is me baptizing a young man. If we can get it up on the screen for a second. I wanna let you guys know that um, when my story went viral, that led me to public speaking all across the country. I spoke with uh, David Jeremiah's church on, on Easter Sunday. Um, I spoke with Tim Tebow, with Duck Dynasty, uh, all sharing my story. And I, and I had all, the, I, I don't mean this um, as proud or to boast, but I had all this success and, and fame and, and I knew for a fact God was calling me to start a church in our hometown. And so I called PD, who, who's still my pastor, even though I'm a head pastor, I still call him my pastor. And I, I called him, I said, man, I need some advice. I think God's calling us to start a church, but how do I do it? And so fast forward, our first year of, of ministry, our first, we started the Cross Church in Lucasville, Ohio. And our first year of ministry, we saw more than 50 salvations, 25 baptisms, and, and yeah, praise God, it's nothing that we've done, and it's not. We, we live in a town of 2,000 people. Like, God is, is moving so heavily in that area, and it's very much to do with, with your all's generosity, with Pastor Daniel, and, and you guys don't realize it, but you have another satellite campus in Lucasville, Ohio. 
when I don't feel like preaching, I just show PD on stage and then they, my, my attendance is really up during those weeks. Um, but I remember there was a um, point in my life when I went home with my wife and I told her, her mom and dad, her dad was, was really legalistic, um, grew up in a church where it was just his way or no way and there's no other outside thinking of that. And for me, at 17 years old, when I got saved, I had no knowledge of church. And so as I started to get in this family, I started to realize like, man, this is a bit off from what I'm used to. So I go home and I tell him, that, hey, I'm going to this church and I'm trying to lead your, your daughter um, through my faith and, and as, a, as a man, I'm trying to lead her and I, it's been absolutely incredible and they're changing their name to Better Life. And he said, Better Life? And he scoffed. I mean, it was like a laugh in my face. And he said, tell that to Job. Tell that to Job. And I was a little confused, admittedly so. And at the time, I wasn't gonna argue. It's not the type of person you argue with. And I walked away from that. And, I, and it really made me curious in the book of Job and why he would say that. And so I, I began to study the book of Job and, and there, was, there was a picture I wanna show you guys. And this is one of the things that inspires my sermon today. My, uh, it's my little girl. She, how, how does the better life, how does it go from the picture on your left to being two and a half years old, diagnosed with leukemia? I had just given up this entire career. I was uh, vice president of a company that was sold for $6 billion. I'd given it up to start a church in my hometown. I didn't make a penny off the church. Still don't. And in the middle of this process, my daughter's diagnosed with leukemia. So how do you go from the better life in both of those moments, my beautiful wife, my beautiful daughter, my beautiful son, to a pastor that gives up his entire life, gives up his entire career to follow Christ, to start a church, and not even months later, my daughter diagnosed with cancer. And it didn't really hit me until probably three months ago. A man from Kentucky, had, had, we'd been connected through a family who knew both of us. His son was diagnosed with leukemia as well. And we got to build a relationship with one another and I started to call and check on him. Our daughter was ahead of, uh, in, the, in the journey, so to speak, of, of the treatment. And I called him one day, and it was probably my third or fourth time talking with him, and I, I finally I said, hey man, I'm glad your son's doing better, but how are you? How's your faith? And his response was this. He said, I'm just like Job. What? You're just like Job? He said, yeah, if, if, it's just like my pastor said. If God can, can cause Job to suffer, or allow Job's, Job to suffer, and he's this righteous man, I've done a lot of sin in my life. I've committed a lot of sin. And I think that, that God's just allowing this to happen, to teach me something. And man, my heart broke for this dad, knowing that, that this, this, this religion that was peddled amongst many of our American churches today are teaching this, this theology that Job, that God allowed Job to suffer who is a righteous man, so certainly he will allow you to suffer. I can guarantee you if you've been around church long enough, you've probably heard a similar sermon before. And every time I've ever heard one of those sermons, I, I, for whatever reason, I, I'm, I'm repulsed Right, I, I'm, I'm thinking, man, this can't be true, God. And so you've either heard Job through that lens, right? You've either heard Job through the lens of, hey, if God will allow Job to suffer, he's a righteous man, he'll allow you to suffer as well. That's the story of Job, right? A righteous man who endures unjust suffering 
loses everything he has, or you've done what most of us have probably done, and, and you go to our, our, our handy assistant, Google, and you feel like, man, I'm this person trying to follow Christ, I've got a good heart, I'm trying to do God's will, but it seems like all these bad things happen to me. And so you Google search, hey, uh, what is, where in scripture is there a man who's righteous, who's trying to follow Christ, and everything bad happens to him? Where is that in scripture? And I wanna read this, because that's gonna give me the answer I seek. And you read it, and it starts out like this. Job 1, there was a man in the land of Uz, whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and shunned evil. That's how you read it. And if you're like me, when you read this, you think, ah, yeah, that's me. I'm perfect, upright. Wait a second. Is that describing you or I? If we're honest with each other, right? If we're all completely honest, does that describe? Does Job 1.1, when it says, that man, that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and shunned evil. I don't think on my best days my wife would ever describe me as perfect and upright. And so we, we continue to read on in Job. And, and the scene pans from Job being perfect and upright to what? What does it pan to? It's this view of the heavenly realms. And God's sitting there, and this, and in comes these angels. And, and the accuser, the hostile one, Satan. And Satan comes up to God, and God says, hey, where have you been? And Satan says, God, I've been roaming throughout all the world. And God says, did you, did you see, Satan, did you see Job? He's a man of God. There's no one in all the world like him. And again, at this point, we're thinking, ah, oh, yeah, that's me, that's me. Ain't nobody like me, baby. I'm, I'm set apart, God's called me. I mean, that's what we think, and then all of a sudden, it's like, wait a second, what's the next part that happens? Satan says, well, God, is it, is it for no reason that Job follows you? Because you've given him everything. But what if, what if you take everything from him? I'd be willing to bet God that, that, that when, when you take everything from him, if you even take one little thing from him, he's gonna turn his back. And so every Christian I've ever known, including myself, especially early on, has read this text, and if you are honest with yourself, you would say, hmm, that doesn't sit right with me. God, why would you do that? He's righteous and blameless and upright. You've said he's, he's, he's set apart. No one's like him. And, and God, you're gonna settle some bet with Satan and allow Satan to take everything from him just so you can prove that you're, you're servants? What? That doesn't make any sense. And it's, it's, it's something that if you're honest with yourself, you would say it's controversial. And it might even be a contradiction to everything you've ever known. And so what we do is then we go back to the book of Psalms, right? And we quickly start reading Psalms and then we realize that wait, the Psalms are pretty crazy too. And so then we just say, you know what, I'll stick to Jesus. I'll stick to Jesus, in the New Testament. And what that creates oftentimes is this superficial faith. This, this faith that's on the surface. And so when bad things happen to us, when things, when I call them these bigger than life moments, when these bigger than life moments hit, when my daughter at two and a half years old is diagnosed with leukemia, man, if, if, if you don't know where your identity is, if your identity is not, if your identity is not firmly planted in Jesus Christ, those bigger than life moments, when they hit, they're gonna cripple you to your knees. They are. And so I, I wanna, try and take a look today that through scripture that the book of Job is not pointing out to this righteous man that, that suffers and so because he suffers, we also can suffer. 
And I, I would seriously ask you to consider for a second if the questions that we bring to scripture on how can I fix this, what can Christ do to me, how can Christ bless me, the, the questions that we're asking through scripture and the answers we're seeking, if those questions really illuminate what all the Old Testament and all the New Testament is about. If those questions illuminate what all of Old Testament and New Testament's about. And if, if, one of the biggest things I believe is that we exist to introduce people to Jesus. That, that, if, if that's true, if that statement, we exist to introduce people to Jesus is true, then how do we do that? Through those bigger than life moments. How did Jesus do it? Are you with me? How, how, how did Jesus do that? Because if we exist to introduce people to Jesus, then, when, then our response to those circumstances, our response to those bigger than life moments should look like Jesus's. And here's how we do that. We have to learn to be with Jesus so we can become like Jesus so we can do what Jesus did. We've gotta to learn to be with Jesus so we can become like Jesus, so we can do the things that Jesus did. And so, rather than give you what my perspective of Job is, what my perspective of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible is, I wanna give you what Jesus says the Old Testament is, what Jesus says it's about. And you'll find this answer in Luke 24, 44 through 47. Here's the, here's the setting that's happening here in Luke. Jesus has just rose from the dead. Everything that happened on Good Friday and Easter weekend as we know it, it has just taken place. And Jesus meets with his disciples to have a Bible study. That's essentially what they're doing. And here's the verse. Don't miss this. Jesus says to his disciples, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. What's he saying there? He's getting very specific, yes. But he's saying everything that was written in the Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible, everything was written about Jesus, about me. He says, this is what's written. It must be fulfilled, and it is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so, they, so that they could understand scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And if you're sitting in your seat, even somewhat paying attention to the sermon, you're probably thinking to yourself, I don't see that in the book of Job, <laughs> right? I, so, so let's break this down. I don't wanna insult your intelligence, but I wanna make this so simple for us that Jesus is saying, like, this is a summary, right? Jesus is saying, hey, here's the summary of the Hebrew Bible. Here's the summary of all the Old Testament. Even the book of Job, this is what the book of Job is about. I'm gonna break it, th break it down to you in three points. And it's, and it's in the last section we read there, it says, then he opened their minds so that they could understand scripture. He told them that this is what is written. The Messiah will come, right? So there's a Messiah. And especially in this time period, the, like the word Messiah meant God's righteous, blameless, like it was the chosen one, right? So everyone for years and years and years and years was expecting a Messiah. And so the Messiah at, this, at the point of time that in Job was not known to be Jesus. They weren't looking for a man named Jesus, right? They were looking for a Messiah to come and save them and redeem their people, absolutely. But the Messiah meant like God's chosen one, his blameless one, his righteous one. And so there are many people who are thought to be the Messiah before this. So here's, here's point one of the summary of all of Old Testament. The Messiah will come and he will suffer unjustly. Isn't that the point, really? That the Messiah will have unjust suffering. Unjust suffering. 
and will rise from the dead, and the repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached to all nations. So there's three things there. The Messiah will come, he will endure unjust suffering, and then that Messiah will, will make a sacrifice. And because of that sacrifice, because of his repentance, because of his, his, his absolute submission to God, forgiveness will be brought to what? All nations. So that's the three points that, that, that Jesus is saying here that like, hey, all of the Old Testament is really about this summary right here. And so I wanna try and take this from a 30,000 foot view. I'm not gonna give you, uh, please, please go home and, and read this. Uh, don't take my word for it. Go home and read it. At the, uh, the church we founded, everybody jokes about every Sunday that I preach the whole Bible, every, every time I preach. And I got news for you, that's gonna happen today. I'm gonna gloss over at least the first portion of the Old Testament to see if there's this, this melody that comes about through the Old Testament, right? Because if it's true, if what Jesus is saying here is true, then we should be able to find that melody all throughout scripture. And that melody is this, the Messiah, the, the righteous, blameless, chosen one, they will endure unjust suffering. But there will be a sacrifice because, from that Messiah, from that righteous, chosen one, that will, be, that will bring uh, restoration, that will bring repentance, that will bring freedom to all of the nations. See, it's like this. Stay with me here for a second. I promise you, I, I will try to make this make sense. How many of you have ever heard of Blue Note Jazz? Please shoot your hand if you've heard that. If you're a music guy, you've heard Blue Note Jazz. I see a few of you. The rest of you think, God, you're like me. We're all rednecks. We've never heard of Blue Note Jazz music before. I'm from the border of, uh, of Ohio, right? Right on the border of Kentucky, West Virginia. I, I got the mix of, of the worst of the worst or the best of the best, truly. But Blue Note Jazz music started in the 30s. And, and it really was um, African-American musicians who were never given a voice before. And this, this group, this Blue Note Jazz was really about bringing the, these individuals and giving them a spotlight. But Blue Note Jazz has this, has this one, this one uh, uh, feature of it that really sets it apart from other music. And this one feature is in Blue Note Jazz music, in the first 20 or 30 seconds of the song, you'll hear the core melody. You'll hear these, these beats. And every verse after that core melody is played, the core melody gets played again over and over and over and over again. And every verse that it gets played, so second and third and fourth and fifth time, they, instru they, they, uh, they introduce a new instrument. So if I was any what musically inclined and wouldn't just make a fool of myself, I would try and show you that. But it's, it's this core beat, right, for 20, 30 seconds. And then that core beat repeats itself. And only this time they'll add some violin in. And the third time it repeats itself again. And only this time, the violin's there, and there's also a drum, or a flute, or a snare, and that's all the instruments I know. But th that, that's the point. Is a snare an instrument? I think so, maybe. Sounds good. So, I would argue that all the Old Testament is like this melody. Because this is the, this is the summary that Jesus gives of the Messiah coming, and during unjust suffering, and then offering a sacrifice that brings repentance and forgiveness to all nations, that's the core melody of all scripture. And so let's start in Genesis. Let's start in Genesis 1-9 with Adam. Adam is this righteous, chosen, blameless man. And God in Genesis breathes his breath of life in this, this garden is formed, the water pushes away, the earth rises up, and there's this, this garden of, of potential that rises from this. And so what does God do? He, he creates these animals from the dust, and he creates this one man, Adam, who he said is righteous and chosen, set apart, and is what? It's different than any other animal. He's made in his image. And so this is that Messiah, right? This is, that, this is literally the definition of the Messiah, the chosen one. 
And so Eve comes along, and just like our, my wife messes everything up, I do everything right, she messes everything up. She's not watching this today, I assure you, so we're good. Um, but that's what happens, is Eve comes in, and there's this garden. But, but it wasn't necessarily just Eve, right? Who else was there? Serpent. And the serpent weaves his web of lies to make Eve and Adam feel like they can be God. That they can be God. And so Eve is deceived. But guess who's not deceived? Eve's deceived and she eats the apple. Adam takes a bite of that apple or fruit willingly. And we have this first picture of Jesus willingly giving his life for us. Adam's giving up eternity. He's giving up union with God because he loves Eve so much. It's a picture that Jesus knew no sin but became sin, right? That's the picture, that God loved us so much he gave his own life for us. And that's why we call Jesus the second Adam. So so here we're instantly seeing the melody, but what happens? God laments right after that, right? It's like, he says, from dust you, you came to dust you will return. And it's this picture of God lamenting over his creation because of the separation that has happened from Adam and Eve and the serpent. And then Cain and Abel come along and a brother kills another brother and after that, seven generations come. And what, what does the Bible specifically say? It says the innocent blood cries out from the ground. So can we see the melody yet? this righteous, blameless, chosen one, now there's this unjust suffering, this innocent blood crying out from the ground, this separation from God. And what happens? God says these people are gonna kill them. They're, they're, they're gonna kill one another. They're gonna destroy the entire earth. And so what's gonna happen is I'm gonna expedite this process. I'm gonna expedite this process. And who comes on the scene? Noah. And again, we have this righteous, blameless man. Wait, that sounds familiar. And actually, God calls him his righteous and blameless servant. That sounds familiar. And he, 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 this is where it gets a little crazy again, right? I'm gonna stick you in this box, and I'm gonna flood the world, and, and you and your family are gonna be protected, but you gotta bring two by two animals, right? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna repopulate the world through you. And so what happens then is Noah goes in and does what? He, the minute he steps off this, this mountain and the land is dry, he goes and makes an altar. And he, sacrifice, and he sacrifices something at the altar and he surrenders to God. So this righteous, blameless servant, again, endures unjust suffering. It was unjust enough to be on a boat for that long a period with all those animals and, and with your family. You can't do anything except for being there. I can't imagine the nagging and complaining and all the, the animal feces that was around you. Like That's unjust suffering in and of itself. Not to mention, this is where I get a little serious. Think about all the relationships that he had. He had other family there. He had friends there that he just saw all wiped off earth. I'm sure he suffered. I'm sure he knew pain. I'm sure he was a man familiar with pain. And so as soon as he steps off the boat, he makes a sacrifice and he says, God, I surrender to you. My life is yours. And what happens? God says, man, that's, that's it. That surrender, that Messiah, that chosen one that surrenders his life, even through suffering, even through unjust suffering, because of this sacrifice, I'm gonna repopulate the world and I'll never flood it again. And forgiveness comes to all nations. Do you see it? And fast forward. It's this melody throughout scripture. And what happens right after that is uh, Noah starts this garden again and we say, oh God, yes. No, you saved the day. Here comes a garden again, right? Here comes this garden. And then all of us at the same time realize, wait a second, the garden is not good. Do not start the garden. We don't want more fruit. We don't want more, ser more serpents. And what happens? Noah then eats some fruit of the garden, becomes drunk, 
they go into this, this tent and some uh, sexual scandal happens that gives birth to Canaan. And then generation after generation after generation of Canaan comes Nimrod. And Nimrod is this man of war, he's a hunter, and he's proud of it. And it's this kingdom, this, this entire empire is built on nothing but bloodshed. And again, we see that like, man, there's this, this righteous, blameless man who endures unjust suffering, that the world turns its back on God. And what do we see next? We see Nimrod stand up this, this empire called Babylon. And it's the archetype of, of evil in the, Old Text, in the Old Testament. It's an empire built on nothing but bloodshed. And so God looks down as Babylon is building a tower of what? What are they doing? They built a tower of their own culture, symbolizing themselves that, hey, just like an Adam and Eve, I can be God. That's what they said. So they built this tower, worshiping themselves. And it's like this picture of the serpent weaving his web of lies again through the, the, these, this fallen humanity to tell them that, hey, your identity is not in Christ. Your identity is not in God. Your identity is whatever you want it to be. Your identity can be whatever you want it to be, and you, you're, you are your own God. And we see them build the statue, this tower. But if only there were one man that were righteous and blameless, if only there were one man. And in steps who? Abram, or Abraham. And guess what God calls Abram? Righteous, blameless servant. He says, this is my righteous, blameless servant. Here he is. And, it, and, and you're thinking to yourself, man, that melody certainly seems true. It's going on and on. And every time there's this serpent that's weaving his web of lies to humanity to try to make them believe that they are their own God, that there is no God, that you can do what you want. And this destruction happens. And even with Abram, even with Abram, if you follow along that story, you see it starts out really good and the forgiveness of sin to all the nations come across after God scatters him at Babylon. He sees Abram and says, hey, there there he is again. Abram makes a sacrifice and the same thing repeats itself. And so when we get to the book of Job, this should be like, the 11th hour of that entire quartet, that entire, that entire, whatever you would, all those musicians playing their instruments. And it's like, wait a second. There are only three times in, in the Old Testament that someone is referred to as the righteous, blameless servant. Abram, Noah, and Job. Abram, Noah, and Job. And what happens in the book of Job? you start to see that like this, this serpent start to try and weave his web of lies. And, and he, what happens to that servant, that righteous, blameless servant, that Messiah at the time, is he endures unjust suffering. His wife and kids are murdered, all of his crops gone, all of his farm taken from him, everything he has wiped off the face of the earth. Wiped off completely the face of the earth. And in, in the book of Job, there's really three parts. There's a prologue, a dialogue, and an epilogue. And the prologue is all about Job and his righteousness. It's all about how he's set apart. The second portion is like this, this argument between Job and his friends. And here's what's unique, and here's what God really hit me with when I started studying the book of Job, is when, when it starts to describe this, it, start, it starts to describe all of Job's friends from different nations. And it doesn't just tell you the name of those friends, it tells you the name of his friends and what specific nation they were from. And these friends come to Job and they say, Job, you couldn't have been uh, righteous and blameless. You had to have sinned for all these things that happened to you. And he says, guys, I promise you, I've done nothing. And, and the last section of Job starts to be this, this lament, this cry out. 
It's just like the innocent blood crying out from the ground. That is an exact representation of what it looks like. This innocent blood, Job crying out, saying, God, if I could just, like it starts out with him having all these prayers and petitions for God. And by the time all this suffering endures, he, the final prayer of Job is just, God, I just need to meet with you. I just need to talk directly to you. I just need to see you face to face. And God grants his prayer and meets with him face to face. And God begins to tell Job, Job, I imagine God picking up this dust. Job, were you there? when I created the entire world, when I spoke the world into existence? Were you there when I knitted you together in your mother's womb? Who are you to question me? And when Job sees God in all of his glory and, and we all get, held, held, we all get, uh, all we get stuck on that one part, of like, oh, well, the Bible says you can't see Job, you can't see God, and Job saw God. Come on. It's this melody again playing out that's saying, man, there's this righteous, blameless servant that's coming. He's coming and he's gonna under just, unjust suffering. And what does Job do? This is where, this is where it, it really hits home, is Job then repents. This righteous, blameless man who's not sinned before, right? He, he, he gets on his knees before God and says, God, oh my gosh, I had, I had heard of you, but now I see your glory and I am nothing. I'm not righteous, I'm not blameless, I am absolutely the dust of the earth compared to you, God. You are God and I'm not. And it's this picture of complete surrender again. But here's what happens, and I, I didn't put this up there, I didn't plan on reading it, but I do have a little time, so I wanna read this. Job 42, seven through 10. After the Lord had spoken these words to Job, talking about how, how he's God and Job's not, don't, don't miss this. The Lord said to Eliphaz, the Tamanite, again, that's the nation he's from. My anger burns against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take seven bulls and seven rams, go to my servant Job, and offer a burnt offering to, for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you. My righteous, blameless servant Job shall pray for you. For I will accept his prayer, but I'm not gonna accept yours. I will accept my righteous, blameless servant's prayer. For you have not spoken to me, you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant, as my servant Job has. So Eliphaz the Tamanite, Bildad the Shuzite, and Zophar the Namathite went and did what the Lord had told them, and the Lord accepted Job's prayer. Can you quickly see how this righteous, blameless servant endured unjust suffering. And because of his complete sacrifice to Christ, God brings healing, restoration, and freedom to all the nations. It's this melody that continues on over and over and over again. And so how, how can the better life be in both balances? Pastor Daniel says it all the time. The better life is not the, the absence of pain. The better life is the presence of Jesus. And this is the last point that I wanna make to you. All these times throughout scripture, all these times throughout scripture, the people of the land were wondering, man, where is, where is this righteous and blameless servant? And they said, man, there he is, there he is. He's gonna redeem us. He's gonna be the one that goes between us and God and restores our land. And every time they are let down. The last verse of the book of Job is that he dies. And I can imagine everybody there saying, oh, there he was, the righteous, blameless servant. 
He was doing so well for so long, and then he died. Ah, what if there were one? What if there were one to come that would stare down the endless pit, the endless abyss of sin and death and sickness and hurt, and would look us straight down the, the barrel and say, I am gonna defeat this once and for all. I am that righteous, blameless servant. I am the Messiah that has come. I will give my life freely. I'll offer my life as a living sacrifice. I will become sin, although I have never sinned, so that I can make you right for all eternity with God. That's that melody. And all of Old Testament is the, simply the silhouette of a man and in steps Jesus on the cross. Job is not an answer. Job, Job is not meant to answer all of life's questions. It's not meant to be a place of reference when we Google, God, what do we do when we're suffering? You know what the answer is? It's not something you can just stick in your pocket. The answer is a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. And here is the very last thing I'll leave you with. Day, five, day 14 at the hospital, of my daughter's diagnosis. They had already tried chemo and steroids and they told us that if day 15 didn't come, and if day 15 came and her blood, the cancer in her blood was not zero, then her prognosis was next to nothing. It meant that her cancer was chemo resistant. So day 14, I got on my knees and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and I said, God, help us please. And I gave this, this prayer of complete surrender and I was so broken and hurting, and all of our people across our town and, and area were all praying for us. And day 15 hits. Don't celebrate just yet or you can, but day 15 hits. And I walk out there in Cincinnati, there's a big hallway and you walk out and there's 20 doctors standing around. And they all discuss with you your, your, your daughter's or your patient's prognosis and they said, Luke, the cancer is at 0.004. And I jumped up and down with my daughter and I was crying and I was praying and I was giving God praise and they all knew me as this pastor who was on fire for Jesus and I declared Jesus' healing in front of every single one of them that day. And I openly prayed for them and it all stands around me, Muslims and every other world religion and, and atheists and everybody. And the next day I walked back out and her cancer had returned. man that was tough I got on my knees at this altar at the hospital and I was so mad at God I said God my dad left us when I was 10 you know my heart God one of the only things I want to do is be a good dad and a good husband that's one of the only things I want to do God and you're taking my little girl from me and it was a, it was a unique moment with myself and God and God said she wasn't yours to begin with she's mine this is all mine you mistakenly think to yourself that you're God and this is yours. It's mine and I will call her home whenever I want to. And man, for me that was so freeing because it made me realize that he's God and I'm not. And there is gonna be a day and it's not just some false hope we have. There is gonna be a day that no matter what happens we are reunited with Christ in heaven forever with no more sickness, no more pain, no more hurting. And the complete work that melody, although Christ was the, the crescendo, Christ was the every single instrument playing, and he is the fulfillment, it is finished with Christ on the cross, that melody continues. And when we endure suffering, this is why I, I firmly believe we exist to introduce people to Jesus, because when we suffer, people should see Christ in us. When we go through tough times, we should be Christ to them. And they should look at it and say, man, how are you doing this? It's not that you've got all, all of it together, it's not that you got all the answers, but it's because Christ has finished the works and lives and breathes inside of you. And so what is there you can't do? What is there you can't overcome? And that's why it's a better life. And so may God bless you, may God keep you, and let it be so.